I'm Ray Allen, uh, provost at MICA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture by Jeff Koons. I only wish there had been a little more interest in this talk, uh, but we'll make do. Um, it's always great to have one of our most distinguished alums join us for yet another one of his visits. Uh, Jeff, over the years, has been very, very generous in coming back and talking with students, and it's nice to see that he's here to talk with yet another group of students. Uh, since graduating from MICA in 1976, to state the obvious, Jeff has become one of the world's most celebrated artists, and yet um, he remains among the world's most provocative and I think singular in terms of his vision. Uh, it is always special to have Jeff with us, but it's particularly special today since Jeff has timed his visit to join us in celebrating the forthcoming retirement of one of our most senior and venerated faculty members, Abby Sangiamo. Um, coincidentally, I had dinner with a, a group of alums last week, more or less from Jeff's era, and when I asked them uh, who uh, were their favorite faculty, uh, most of them said Abby Sangiamo at the top of their list. And I know that Jeff shares uh, that opinion. So in a few minutes, I'm going to invite Abby up to say a few words about Jeff, but I think uh, it only fitting that I say a couple of words about Abby and contextualize um, uh, the situation. Uh, Abby came to MICA in 1961 uh, after graduating with an MFA from Yale University and teaching for five years at Morgan State University up, up the street. He was clearly uh, among the first of a generation of faculty that took MICA from being a, a sleepy provincial backwater into really a nationally competitive college uh, of art. Uh, I realized uh, in thinking about this presentation this morning that I have known Abby for nearly 42 years come March, which is deeply frightening to me. Um, <laughs> And that I am one of a generation of faculty, I'm looking at some others, who Abby was very instrumental in hiring, or taught, or, or both. And um, for us, as, as a generation of folks who came here late 60s, 70s, uh, Abby was not only our boss, but our mentor. Uh, he was and remains the master teacher. He was the person we all looked up to when we wanted to understand how we could do what we were about better. Um, so, Abby, uh, you may be leaving MICA, but your influence, your impact uh, will continue to reverberate through these halls uh, and affect the development of generations of young artists to come. So come on up here and join me, and join me in giving a hand to Abby. This is Jeff's day, and I'm just going to say a very few words about Jeff. Um, I remember a day, this was after class, I hope, I think Jeff will remember it uh, too, about three o'clock, and um, I was showing you how to use this um, lacquer stick that I had been using at that time. It was new to me, and we needed a flat surface. This is how I remember it. So it might have been on a model stand. In, the, um, in room 140, or maybe on the third floor. So you know how memory uh, sort of rearranges things a little bit. Um, so, um, and, and Jeff seemed interested in we were working. And then when we finished, I said, well, how are things going, Jeff? And he said, well, you know, I'm gonna see Dally this Saturday. I said, what? He said, I'm going to see Dally. I have an appointment to see Dally this time. So Jeff was the one and only student who ever told me they're going to see Dally, to have an appointment to see Salvatore Dally in a few days. So uh, then he said, I think you then said, well, in a few, you're trying to get an appointment with Keinholz. And then, <laughs> so I thought, I, I, I got to remember this. I mean, this, uh, this, uh, I think you were a sophomore at the time. You were in the uh, life drawing class. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so 
that's Jeff Koons, and that's the, um, that's uh, <laughs> uh, I often I wondered, that what if I tried to arrange an appointment for me with Dali? <laughs> he would probably, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Jeff, this is your day and uh, your talk, and uh, it was such a great pleasure knowing you uh, during those years. And uh, another thing, Jeff was always, and this is hard to believe, considering that his own work is so, you know, even to this day considered so radical. <clears throat> and Jeff was a terrific student. I mean, he did his work, the homework, <laughs> everything. So he was not, he was not, you know, I mean, he, and he was really good in spite of what Jeff says as part of the image creating, <laughs> self-image creating. Uh, Jeff could draw wonderfully. He, he painted, one of the teachers, Jim Hennessy, didn't like his painting because of, it was a painting of Jesus Christ and, and you went to the, your violent period then. And uh, so Jesus Christ was torn into pieces and Jeff, Jeff Jim Hennessy, who was Catholic, didn't like, didn't like the, uh, the way Jeff uh, painted. Um, <laughs> But, um, uh, but as I said, uh, um, uh, Jeff was really a, a very good student. One other thing, I, I saw on the cover of Art News um, maybe a year ago, one of the 10, the 10 highest paid uh, artists in the world. And I remembered when I invited you to talk to my, back then, to my basic drawing class, and you got $5 for it. And then it, it was really very, a very good talk, so I invited you again, and this time I raised it to ten dollars. <laughs> so, so, so Jeff was once an employee at ten dollars an hour <laughs> for me. Anyway, that's it. That was fantastic, and uh, you know, I have to say, you know, it's it's a thrill to be back here at uh, Maryland Institute, and uh, you know, are my mic's working. Is everything you can hear me? Okay, because it it means so much. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so it means so much to uh, for me to be here and uh, uh, to interact because it's. Uh, so important to me. When I came here and uh, was a young student, I had no idea of what art could be. And uh, Mike uh, helped me learn what art could be. And uh, Abby, Abby's such an important part of that foundation because uh, you did teach me also that work ethic is very important. And I know I would spend at least 40 hours a week on all those drawings, my homework. And uh, because, you know, focusing on what you're doing is so important, it, uh, and, uh, and of course, as you go on in life, you have to spend a lot more time than just you know, 40 hours focusing on, uh, on your interests there. But uh, I really enjoyed that, and the type of uh, sense of um, humanity that uh, you were able to share with me, I really appreciate that very much, Abby. Um, but when I came to uh, the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art, I always enjoy this story, because it's, it's true. Uh, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania, about 40 miles uh, north here on Route 83. And my aunt would take me to art museums. My father was an interior decorator. But I really was not exposed to uh, museum art. And uh, maybe once a, you know, every five years, I would go to a museum. So uh, after enrolling and uh, the first day of school, we went on the bus to see the Cone Collection. And uh, uh, all the young students, we went in, we saw the collection. I remember going back on the bus to come back to the school and realizing that I didn't know anybody. You know, I didn't know Matisse, I didn't know Brock, you know, I didn't know Manet, I didn't know any of the artists. And I felt that I survived that moment, and that's why I'm here today. And so 
with my own art, and what I think is so important about art as a whole, as a vocabulary, is to help people survive that moment. That art is something that you don't have to be prepared for in any manner at all. That there's nothing demanded of you. There's nothing uh, required that you come to that moment with uh, in advance. Uh, Maryland Institute really opened up to me how all the different disciplines also come into art. Uh, philosophy and psychology and theology. I mean, I remember having theology classes and, and uh, uh, the psychology class. All these different areas uh, really helped uh, me realize what the power of art could be, that it's not just you know, this activity that's removed from uh, all the other disciplines. Uh, as Abby said, I, was a, I always drew, I always painted, and from the time that I was about seven years old, I always took art lessons. And when I was here at the Maryland Institute, I developed a, a, an interest in personal iconography. And I wanted to develop kind of the power of uh, the force of personal iconography. I liked the way that it, it made me feel. I could understand my own uh, power to feel things through personal iconography, but it's also to make the, uh, the viewer feel something. And I remember going to the Whitney Museum in New York and seeing a show by Jim Nutt. And I loved the impact of the paintings. They were paintings on plexiglass. They were very kind of parallel pop, and they made you feel uh, you know, an intensity. So I developed this interest, and uh, Abby was actually uh, very supportive that I would use the student mobility program, and just for my last year, go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and to study with people like uh, Jim Nutt, who I had as a uh, kind of like a one-day uh, type teacher, but with Ed Paschke and uh, Carl Worsom and the Chicago Images. And uh, I, I enjoyed that. I feel that it helped me develop a sense of, uh, of the power of personal iconography. Uh, it helped me continue to go on this inward journey that through Dada and surrealism I had interest in, and uh, to go inward. And I, I continued to do that, and I feel that I developed a sense of power of image, but I became really kind of bored just dealing with myself. And I wanted to... Uh, go outward. I wanted to be involved more in objective art instead of subjective. So I moved to New York, and this is an example of the first uh, type of work that I made when I moved to New York. Uh, this is inflatable uh, uh, bunny and inflatable flower. Uh, this is the first rabbit that I ever did. They're just uh, sitting on uh, store-bought mirror squares, and they're just displaying themselves. So I felt that this uh, you know, was even still kind of showing more of a subjective side of myself, still from this area of dealing with personal iconography. Now, I like the intensity of it. I think that that pink and this kind of color combination has kind of a, a, a zap to it. It has a strength to it. But I felt that it was kind of revealing too much of my own sexuality. So I kind of continue to go on and to make my work a little more uh, less subjective and, uh, on appearance, more objective. In uh, Pennsylvania, where I come from, uh, at Easter time, people put these rabbits out in their yard. And so it's just for me kind of a symbol in a way of also being um, kind of generous. And uh, these objects are really just displaying. They're open. It's just displaying. You have the reflection of the mirror. And it's just kind of a very open situation. Uh, in making the encased vacuum cleaner pieces, which I call the new, I felt that this was uh, going a more objective in that this is an ultimate state of being. Uh, it's about being uh, eternally new. And this kind of confrontation that we have between our internal life, the inside, and the external uh, world. Uh, you know, in the uh, external world, you can come across objects and they can seem like they're better uh, prepared to be immortal, to survive longer than you. So uh, this vacuum cleaner is brand new. I purchased it, I unwrapped it, and then put it immediately in this kind of uh, case that I created that's uh, kind of a very uh, 
modernist display type case, just so it could display its integrity of birth. I thought by making kind of newness uh, uh, visible, this kind of ethereal thing of the new, uh, would add something to the tradition of uh, uh, the ready-made. It was, an, again, an ultimate state of being. This is uh, showing an interaction and type of uh, uh, vocabulary that develops by things being connected together and kind of responding to each other. They create almost like family units, uh, but the, the vacuum cleaners down below could be looked at as masculine, uh, uh, and the one up top uh, also uh, is kind of masculine in color, or things could be reverted and look uh, kind of feminine as far as uh, the vacuum cleaners down below could be kind of womb-like, the, uh, the bag that's there. But the things would go back and forth. The side of the vacuum cleaner says wet-dry, and for me, that's a little bit like uh, Kierkegaard, uh, either or, and uh, the aspect of also like Satra, but I was very influenced by existentialism. This is another ultimate uh, state of being. Uh, this is a one ball total equilibrium tank. So um, I was always a painter and always a drawing and painting. When I moved to New York, I start working with these ready-made objects, just buying things, displaying them from the, uh, for themselves. I make the vacuum cleaner pieces. I started to get a little bit of a recognition, kind of in the avant-garde of of those days in New York, of showing at alternative spaces with the new, my vacuum cleaner pieces. But uh, people would sometimes write about the work in almost a feminine way, like a six, uh, 50s housewife kind of vacuuming. And you know, maybe I made the vacuum cleaners because of that type of confrontation with a powerful object. Maybe children, when you're on the floor crawling around, that's kind of a powerful object that your mother could have. But I wanted to create and work with uh, ready-made things that were looked at more of a masculine uh, framework. So this is slightly more analytical. It's uh, just a tank. It's an aquarium. But I put a, a basketball in there, a sports uh, object. And I have it in equilibrium. So this is kind of like a, a very uh, womb-like situation. It's more biological than this more externalized uh, uh, objects that we saw. And again, an ultimate state of being. All the forces are equal. It's almost like uh, pre-birth and after death. And uh, uh, This was a tool for equilibrium, uh, in the equilibrium show, where I showed a tank, like the one ball we just looked at. This is the first object that I took a ready-made, and I uh, changed it. I transformed it into a different material. Now, an object like this, I would have molded. I would have worked with a foundry, and we would have made a wax of it and then cast it into a bronze and then try to bring back the detail of it. Uh, today, I would take an object like this, and I would scan it. I would x-ray it. We would take uh, that uh, data. We would put it together. And uh, eventually, we would probably end up that we wouldn't make a model at all, that we would just do our engineering and reverse engineering in the piece and just have it milled in uh, metal or whatever other material. Uh, after I did my uh, equilibrium work in 1986, uh, I made uh, the Jim Beam J.B. Turner train, which is part of luxury and degradation. And I was stating to uh, some of the students earlier that uh, I spoke with upstairs that I remember when making my aqualung, that uh, reading a review and people were writing that uh, how the, the, you know, the work was uh, kind of very immoral and it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it, it didn't have a moral base. And I thought everything that I'm doing is so, you know, about morality. And uh, that was an ultimate state of being. And, and I was uh, in the uh, equilibrium show, I was trying to, uh, tell people that it was really about kind of going for it, really trying to make work and not just kind of presenting yourself like you're trying to do something. And in the Luxury Degradation Show, which had a dialogue about luxury uh, and uh, degradation, I was trying to tell people not to give up their economic and political power uh, for uh, luxurious type things, but to maintain their uh, economic political power. And it was trying to 
follow the degradation that sets in on the alcoholic. <clears throat> and I was trying to show how abstraction is used in our society to, to, have, to educate people to a certain degree, but to bring them to a level to debase them and to take away their economic and political chips. Uh, this is seven-fifths of uh, Jim Beam J.B. Bourbon. And so I saw this ready-made uh, train uh, in a showroom window in New York City, and I thought it would be wonderful to transform this into a, an object, into a, a work of art, but how would I do it? Because it's, you know, it's filled with the bourbon. And I realized that that bourbon was really the soul of the piece, so that to be able to transform it and then to get the bourbon back in there, so I... I uh, cast the piece in uh, stainless steel, polished it, and then I took it back to Jim Beam, uh, the company, and they refilled it with the bourbon and we put the tax stamp seal back on. The uh, seal's kind of the interface to the soul. Uh, this work never wanted to be in silver, it never wanted to be in platinum, it wanted to be in stainless steel. And it wanted to be in stainless steel because it's a proletariat material it's a, a fake luxury. I wanted that the viewer would feel economically secure, that they wouldn't feel economic stress, but at the same time, it wasn't trying to uh, be something that it wasn't. This could be melted down and be used for you know, pots and pans. But when you do focus on things, and I'm back to Abby's class, and you concentrate all your energies in a certain area, and you, uh, you follow your interests, it takes you to a very metaphysical place. And the only thing that would keep my bourbon good forever is stainless steel. And it's the same stainless steel that's used in all the piping at the distilleries uh, to preserve the alcohol. But these things happen automatically, metaphysically, when you really focus on your interests. Uh, in the luxury degradation uh, show, I had different objects going from the lowest income, uh, income area, which was an object like a, a pail just that I cast in stainless steel, brought it to a mirror finish, and that was like a poor man's decanter. And I would have paintings that came from ready-made uh, uh, billboards that I would get the plates from the uh, printer and uh, take them and print them on uh, canvas, and they would go from the way abstraction was targeted at a person with an income of 10000 and under to somebody at that time, the highest level they targeted people was $45,000 plus. And at $45,000 plus, you would be targeted with levels of abstraction that were much higher uh, and um, uh, more seductive uh, and more abstract than uh, the 10000 level. And this is stay in tonight for Angelica. Where Somebody's really kind of almost lost in their own thought patterns, you can imagine, as like an alcoholic would be. And there's kind of a sexuality uh, aspect to the, uh, the waves of liquor. But it's really just kind of like degradation set in. They're disconnected. Uh, the, after the luxury degradation uh, show, I did a body of work called Statuary. And when I was making this work, uh, I made this six months after making the last body of work. So, uh, you know, it's a really one of the jo joyful things of youth is how well you just respond to things. Uh, you don't have to contemplate things. You can make decisions really quickly. You move on them. Uh, I have children at home. My 10-year-old, he can work on projects and get something done before, you know, I would even think that he could have a table laid out to even start a project because you learn to adapt to the time that you have, the situations that you have. And as young artists, that's what we do too. So if you have only six months between one show to when another gallery, this was for the Sonnabend Gallery, this was a, a really top gallery in New York, you find a way and you just do it. We're back to the rabbit. Uh, when I made the rabbit uh, in uh, 1978, where I wanted to show people you know, I was uh, making th these pieces when I moved to New York. I wanted to show back to this newer audience that I was developing in 1986 my relationship with ready-mades has existed for a little while. So I made this reference back to that uh, piece that I showed in the very beginning, and I cast the piece in stainless steel. I think one of the reasons that the rabbit is very iconic is that uh, whatever you want to read into it, it gives you that kind of flexibility. 
Uh, it could be an orator like I am right now. I have these microphones here, but it's a little bit like that carrot to the mouth, uh, like an orator. Uh, the carrot to the mouth also could be like a symbol of a masturbator of some type, kind of a surrealist uh, kind of reference there. It could be the symbol of playboy. Uh, it could be the symbol of resurrection, of Easter. Uh, I also like to think of it as the Venus of Willendorf with those tiny little hands and uh, kind of really rounded, rounded forms. Um, in 1987, I showed this piece called Kip and Curl. And uh, Kip and Curl is a, a stainless steel sculpture, and it's a, a ready-made sculpture. I was invited to participate in an exhibition in Munster, Germany. Uh, Kasper Koenig has this international exhibition once every 10 years. And in 1987, for me to participate in the show was a big deal. And I really was excited about it. I went to Munster. And you have to make a site-specific work. And when I went around the town, I saw in the town square that there was this bronze sculpture. And uh, this is a life-size sculpture. It's a man coming to market with a kip on his back. So a kip's a basket. And, a farmer would carry, like, he has a hair coming out of the top of it. He has pigeons hanging on it. It's filled with eggs, potatoes. He has a pipe. He has tobacco. And um, he has a basket there. So it's really a symbol of the self-sufficiency of that community. But uh, today, this type of self-sufficiency has changed. These uh, economies have changed from agrarian-type culture into, like, service type of culture. So this sense of of uh, economic security comes f from a different place or needs to come from a different place. So when I'd make these stainless steel pieces and polish them and give this kind of fake luxury, it was that the viewer would feel economically secure. And I'm just really referencing the way the church has used Baroque art. And if you walk into a Baroque church, you know, you have everything gold leafed and silver leafed and all your economic worries are just they're gone. Because for that moment, you, you, know, you don't have to worry. You feel secure economically. So at least that's one issue that you can continue to have a higher transcendence uh, kind of experience. So that's why I was working with these materials for this type of abstraction. When I made this piece, though, it was a fiasco, absolute fiasco. They took the piece, the foundry, out of the oven too soon. They banged it up against the wall. They totally deformed the piece. Uh, it was in sections before we put it together, but you know the man's leg would have been bent back here, and you know one arm was way up here, too short. The rabbit's ear was basically gone, and I had to make the decision whether to really stay true to my ready-mades because to this point every object that we looked at was an an object was either a real ready-made or it was a transformed ready-made that every perfection and imperfection. I held dear to. If it had a little scratch right here, that little scratch would be there. It'd have to be there. The bottom of the sculpture, I'd spend as much time on the heel of the figure as I would any other uh, part. So it was a real moral decision for me whether I was going to give this radical plastic surgery and try to kind of put this Humpty Dumpty back together again or to just pull out of the exhibition. And I thought it was too important of a show to pull out, so I gave it radical plastic surgery. They brought in the best steel guy in Germany. This man came in, a big guy, and he would heat the sculpture up till it was white hot and just pound it, and we'd stretch an ear out, and we would pound it, and we'd weld another section in here. And in about a month's time, we put this back together again. And it really changed my work, and I never worked uh, directly with a ready-made again. Up till more recent years, I've gone back and using technology and scanning things, I've started, but I never molded. Uh, uh, well, maybe I did mold, but I, not until my Popeye series did I go back. And everything kind of feels a little bit like a, a ready-made, makes references to things that we feel very familiar with, but they're just kind of montage, collage kind of uh, creations. Uh, this is Ushering in Banality. This is a wooden sculpture from 1988. Uh, I'm using the material wood for the, the power of wood. Uh, my work, I, I think I start to articulate here this experience and uh, of coming to the MICA, that first day of going to the museum, realizing how little I knew but surviving that moment. I'm trying to make uh, works 
that. And then I think I start to really vocabulize it, uh, vocabulize it, I hope I'm saying that correctly here, in that trying to communicate to the viewer that uh, their background, their own uh, personal history, their own cultural history is perfect. And it's pretty hard to come across something like this and feel above it. You know, I mean, to feel below it, that automatically you feel equal to it or above it, and that uh, so you wouldn't feel threatened by this experience of uh, interacting with this. It's made out of wood because the church used wood. It's a living material, and there's this aspect of this sense of uh, transcendence that's also uh, embedded into it. I always thought this was a little um, autobiographical that. Uh, I was ushering in banality. I always thought of that as myself in the back, kind of pushing the pig, and that I had, uh, I didn't really care what other people thought, that at least I had some kind of like spiritual help on my side. Uh, this is another piece from Banality, which is Woman in the Tub. Uh, my grandfather had beside his television a uh, little table, and on this table was a little ashtray. And this was made in the 40s. It was uh, something made after the wars, made in Japan. And it was a little knick-knack, uh, a little kind of sexualized content where a woman's lying down on like a little uh, couch. And she's lying back, and her legs are up in the air. And it was an ashtray. You put a cigarette there, and the porcelain was supposed to be fine enough that the legs would swing back and forth. And she'd have a little fan here. Uh, I realize that this is really kind of a remake of that in a, a different way. It, instead of being on this couch, this woman's in a tub, but it, it's the same type of uh, uh, situation for me. And being in a, a porcelain material, uh, I felt that I was trying to remove people's guilt and shame. And I thought a lot of guilt and shame comes from people's own relationship with their body. And so uh, the aspect of the bathroom, of the tub, brings a people's interaction with their own body, relationship with their own body to mind, and uh, this sense of uh, the removal of kind of guilt and shame. She's a little startled. She realizes that somebody's in the tub there with her. She's kind of protecting herself. So there's this sense of victim, uh, victimizer kind of taking place. Uh, this is Michael Jackson in Bubbles. This is a large uh, porcelain. Uh, in this exhibition, Banality, I wanted to have kind of spiritual figures there that would make people feel secure, because I felt that people may feel a little insecure of, of uh, letting go and trusting in their own cultural history, trusting in the things that they respond to in life, uh, accepting that if they like the color pink just because it's pink, that that's all right, or, or blue, or that just everything uh, is fine, whatever you respond to. You know, if you respond to banality, I was thinking about the Newport ads of like people balancing watermelons on their head while playing a trumpet. But if that's what you respond to, th that that's fine, that's great. And so I wanted to have some kind of spiritual figures there uh, to help people uh, have that confidence. So this was kind of like a contemporary Christ-like figure. It's also in the same configuration of the Pieta, this type of Renaissance type of uh, sculpture, as far as its formation. So it's also giving a historical base. Uh, you also had the broken, the Rococo here, but also this kind of Renaissance base. Uh, after the, uh, that body of work, I go on and I make my Maiden Heaven work. Now, my Maiden Heaven work, I can also connect to Micah. <laughs> and, uh, and the way I connect it is really uh, probably my first art history class. I had a teacher uh, here, a Bo Davis, and I remember uh, Manet's Olympia, you know, coming up on the screen, or also uh, Luncheon on the Grass coming up, and uh, l learning about the power of art, and uh, you know, the power also of uh, of uh, the history of art, of romance, the poetic aspect, the history of the nude through art. And uh, so when I made a work like the, uh, the Made in Heaven show, I was continuing the same dialogue that I had with the Banality show, but focusing again more on the body of giving up the guilt and shame. I saw uh, the uh, Masaccio, the expulsion. And uh, in the expulsion, all the guilt and shame of, uh, by Masaccio on Adam and Eve's face. And uh, you know, I'm still working with that same uh, 
imagery t uh, that was in the Masaccio because, you know, in the expulsion, you have Eve like this. And it's called the pudica type of uh, pose. And, you know, in the expulsion, it's a symbol of guilt and shame. But if you look at that in uh, prior times, if you look at Praxiteles, and Praxiteles doing Aphrodite like this, it's the opposite. The, this is revealing. She's exposing herself. She's showing her beauty, her, herself. You know, so it's interesting how things change in time in their content and meaning. But they're the exact same pose used throughout history from Praxiteles onward. Um, this is um, part of the work from the Celebration series. Oh, I'm sorry, I had the puppy up there. Uh, the puppy, after the, uh, the Maiden Heaven work, I made this large floral sculpture and uh, it consists of 60,000 live growing plants. And I wanted to, I guess I felt a little bit attacked from all the, uh, uh, the reaction to the Maiden Heaven work. My interests were really uh, very pure. I wanted to try to make a body of work in the history of, of people like uh, Frogenard and uh, Boucher and and Manet and this aspect back through history and to try to communicate this aspect of self-acceptance. Uh, but I wanted to use everything that I learned through the Baroque and the Rococo and my understanding of, of art history and I created a puppy and I wanted to try to create a piece that was about uh, serving and whether you want to serve or be served. And it's this type of Kierkegaardian dialogue again going back and forth. And uh, so it's a, a piece that's completely fertile. Uh, whenever it's planted, you have uh, birds uh, you know, pollinating and bees pollinating. You have all this life activity taking place. And you see the, uh, the life cycle. You see the plants grow. And you'll see certain plants will want to start to dominate and go out this way. And some will dominate and come out over others in a different direction. And you'll see it also just come to a cycle where it will peak and then it'll, uh, it'll die off. So you get this whole kind of a cycle taking uh, place. So there's this aspect of hope. Even though you always kind of have the understanding of the inevitable, there's this aspect of hope. Uh, this is from the Celebration series. This is a balloon dog. Uh, it's, um, it's not a ready-made, but of course it looks like a ready-made because we're so familiar with these type of uh, objects. But it's uh, just something that uh, somebody would maybe tie up for a kid's birthday party. <clears throat> Behind it is a, a balloon's tulips. And uh, all these objects have a certain kind of sexual interaction also. The, um, just the aspect of it as, as beings, of human beings, we have a uh, certain uh, sexual basis in our whole life, how we uh, continue to exist as uh, um, a species. So, you know, you could look at the balloon tulips and they could be like belly buttons, you know. And I think that there's a certain profoundness, even though something so simple as like a balloon dog, but there's something that's also very archetypal. And that archetypal quality comes from really you know, from a time that we go back into Paleolithic type time period and where, you know, people are uh, kind of looking and they're seeing uh, intestines kind of expanding and they're, they're using intestines and they're doing different things. There's these type of uh, historic type aspects that you can feel automatically kind of archetypal that's uh, almost built into it then, kind of like a Trojan horse quality. Uh, this is another celebration piece, Hanging Heart. Um, I saw just a little plastic heart hanging on ribbon like this in uh, uh, a window, I think a Duane Reed in New York City. So I asked them if I could please have it, and uh, they gave it to me, and I took it to the studio, and I ended up using that for my model, tried to recreate it exactly, and that you know became the Hanging Heart. Uh, has, I think, kind of a romantic aspect and also kind of spiritual aspect. All of these reflective pieces need the viewer. Uh, without you, uh, you know, you've, you, nothing happens. There's, it, it, it needs you to be able to, uh, to have it exist. And when the viewer uh, is in contact with it, it's giving you affirmation. 
because when you walk around, it's reflecting you. It's always recognizing and affirming your existence, that it's about you. The moment's about you, and uh, any transcendence would come from within you. Uh, this is the moon. This just happens to be shot in uh, Versailles. <clears throat> and uh, uh, it was kind of interesting when we installed this. Uh, Ludwig II, which is another uh, king that I really enjoy a lot, used to be the moon king. Cause, and he became the moon king because he enjoyed Louis XIV, Louis XIV, so much. So much He was the sun king. But uh, when we brought the, the moon... <laughs> Into, the, into Versailles down the, uh, the Hall of Mirrors. They took out a very large window on one end, and around midnight, they brought the moon in. And it was like uh, an, uh, uh, a celestial type of event, watching this uh, moon come across from outside into the, uh, the hall and come down. Uh, this is a painting from Celebration. This is Plato. Uh, in this uh, body of work, I just uh, would take different uh, objects and I would photograph them and then I made paintings uh, out of them. Today, the way I make my paintings is exactly uh, the same way uh, as this painting. These are really kind of very large paint by numbers and I, there are millions of shapes there, but everything's a hard edge shape. And uh, my new paintings, it's, all, it's wet into wet, but I still use the same technology to create the image to get a kind of a perfect base, a perfect drawing. But uh, uh, every uh, edge is a hard edge because I thought it would be more of an objective experience. People would see the more the same thing if there was no blending. If you blend, uh, if you have white here and black here and you have a gradation, you ask somebody, you know, if it's blended here, where the black stops, everybody would give you a different point. But I thought that if I had uh, separation of uh, edges that everybody would always give the same. Um, this is a painting, Lips, uh, making art historical references. Uh, I love uh, referencing. I mean, for me, the power of art is through referencing. It's what uh, connects us. Uh, and connecting yourself with different artists uh, connects you to uh, human history and uh, collects, connects you to the kind of the true uh, narrative. But here I'm making reference from everyone from like Leonardo with the, the hair. That was from a, an ad for shoes, I think Chanel shoes. And I just dropped out the face and dropped out the shoes, just used the hair. Uh, lips uh, from some uh, cosmetic company. But it's a little bit like uh, Man Ray's, uh, is it a, a dictaphone? What's it called? It goes back and forth. Metronome. Metronome. And, uh, but there's a sense, even the corn, I thought of Dali, this kind of aspect of the Western European kind of trans avant-garde of the uh, early uh, 20th century. Uh, this is a lobster. This is from my Popeye series in uh, uh, 2003. And uh, I've always enjoyed uh, uh, acrobatic uh, aspects of, of, uh, of things because of this contact of also the mind and kind of the body together. But I thought that this lobster reminded me a little bit of Duchamp with, uh, you know, uh, L-H-O-O-Q, where he drew the mustache on the Mona Lisa. It's also like Dali. But it's also uh, uh, very acrobatic. It can be both masculine and feminine. If you look at this form, it can be, you know, a strong-armed and masculine, uh, phallic, or it could be very womb-like, and the arms could be like fallopian uh, tubes and very womb-like. Uh, this is a painting called uh, Elvis, and uh, I saw this uh, in a men's magazine. It was like GQ or something. They had uh, uh, this woman, uh, this Playboy bunny, spread out that went across, and there were four different uh, views of her, and it was really just like Andy's Elvis, where you have like one here and here, you know, going straight across. And I thought, oh, you know, it looks a little like Lisa Marie. And uh, so I ended up, I just used two of her uh, here, and behind her, I put H.C. Westerman. And H.C. Westerman is a, an artist that was kind of involved with personal iconography, but he had this desire for transcendence, really into more kind of a pop objective art. 
And when he would make his self-portraits, he would always give himself a pencil bar mustache, just a straight uh, line here. And uh, he would become like Clark Gable. And so there'd be kind of this reference of transcendence through the medium of film, of kind of Hollywood. And he's covered in the background. He'd also put himself in tucks and tails. So you can see a little bit of his tucks and tails. But the background prints from his dance of death. And I treat it like a Warhol car crash and flip it and re uh, invert it. And I give, make like six panels going down through there. And on top, I put this woman like one of Andy's Elvises and then have the lobster on top as a reference to uh, Duchamp and Dali. And again, ending with the Mona Lisa with L-H-O-O-Q. So this work was really about a transcendence in the objective art. Uh, this is a, a piece called uh, Caterpillar Ladder from the Popeye series. All these objects go through things. It's a ready-made ladder. Uh, the pool toy is uh, something that I, I molded and transformed into aluminum uh, and put through this. But these objects go through things without losing their course, not uh, uh, being uh, deterred. Uh, I remember seeing like trees growing through chain link fence and I would always look and oh that's really interesting and when I would look up close I would see the trauma and uh, the deformation that would take place to the tree and it would become deformed and, I, oh, and I'd look at oh that's interesting but I really don't have so much interest there so I wanted to have these things go through things without having that trauma or uh, distortion. Uh, this is a, a painting from the Hawk Elvis series which continues this kind of uh, Warhol type of uh, double Elvis thing. And um, I have different images going on that uh, silver paint with a train meeting a horse and buggy that was symbolizing kind of a sexual tension that I have also in here with Popeye and olive oil and this part of the Hawk Elvis series. In also the celebration series, I made this piece called Diamond. And I think this is really one of the most relevant works to the work that I'm doing today, just for its meaning. A lot of people look at the diamond and they think it's about bling. But uh, I spent a lot of time uh, working on, especially on these posts. Uh, I guess the diamond took me many years to make, but the posts I carved for about two years, I kept recarving them. And uh, there are four posts on the outside of the diamond. And those posts are really uh, a symbol of male energy and uh, there's uh, another post that got inside already because this is like the, uh, the unfolding of life, like the fertilization of the egg, and all the facets of life are unfolding. And as far back as you can go in human history is to, uh, back to the very uh, far point of the diamond. And that's our true narrative. I mean, all of art, all of the mythology, all the things that we deal with, deal with narrative, and narrative is so important to everything, but the only true narrative is the biological narrative, and that's the unfolding of the biological narrative. That's our true history. Uh, this is one of the new paintings from the Antiquity series. Uh, I found uh, this little uh, palette knife painting on the street about 30 years ago. And it's an ocean scene. It's kind of referencing kind of Corbet a little bit. Uh, or uh, is it uh, Tim Ross or Tom Ross who used to uh, teach you how to paint on TV with a palette knife? Bob Ross. But, uh, you know, Aphrodite, of course, means from, a, the, from the foam of the sea. So it's very uh, frothy and uh, a very palette knife. Uh, you have uh, Aphrodite there with her son Eros and Pan. And Pan is you know, trying to, uh, 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 you know, kind of make his uh, way with her. But this is an early sculpture where you start to have the narrative also be functioning, the support of the work, what helps it structurally stay together, be part of the narrative. If you see the support in between Pan and uh, Aphrodite, you can see it's kind of functioning very much there as kind of a symbol of, uh, uh, of a male. Uh, there's this kind of archetypal line drawing that I also uh, put on the top of uh, this painting, you know, which is just kind of a symbol of uh, 
you know, kind of Mother Earth or something, but it's uh, making reference to like French 19th century type of painting that's also referencing a human form. Uh, this is another painting. This is called Antiquity Manet. And uh, the background is Manet's uh, Christ being tormented by the soldiers. Uh, Manet is referencing his heroes. You can see over with us, I have a pointer here, but he's referencing uh, in this area here. This figure is like Caravaggio or uh, also uh, Velazquez. So uh, this type of uh, connecting back through history is uh, the closest uh, thing that we have as far as um, paralleling this biological uh, type of narrative is where we make reference to uh, um, other things. Anything that references something else is uh, striving to uh, function as a biological kind of narrative. I really think that's the power of art. This has a kind of a very generic kind of modernist sculpture uh, of, uh, of a couple uh, uh, kissing. Uh, behind it is uh, Christ being tormented by the soldiers. The one uh, soldier over here has a very uh, uh, primitive type fur uh, cape that looks like he's either just pulled off Christ, like flaying him, or, but it gives reference to a cavernous type situation. And so we end up back in kind of Plato's cave or foundation of enlightenment. Uh, and uh, here's an image of gazing balls. And uh, so, you know, these are the things that I grew up with. These are the things that I contemplate. And uh, I was, you know, I always want to be able to uh, make the gestures that I really want to make in life. I want to make the artworks that will really help me uh, live to my potential. And I know everybody uh, here as an artist, that's what we want to do is live to, to our potential. And uh, art is uh, being a, a vehicle to try to, to help make that uh, uh, gesture, to try to accomplish that. But I just wanted to show kind of my uh, sources, the things that I look at and contemplate and that I have a dialogue with that I believe that my uh, gestures uh, can come from. Uh, you know, everything is already here. And, uh, you know, nothing comes into the universe. It's really just that we open ourselves up to uh, the acceptance of everything that's here and to accept it so that it's can be in play and that we can use it. Uh, subjective art is about the acceptance of self. Uh, objective art is the acceptance of others. And all of these objects, all of these type of images are metaphors for uh, either self-acceptance or the acceptance of others. Uh, it's just the way people work with uh, images and uh, objects. So the highest uh, state of uh, art that uh, I believe exists comes from just complete uh, acceptance. So uh, I think the way that that comes about is by trying to remove anxiety and that uh, by uh, removing anxiety it leads you uh, into greater uh, aspect of uh, acceptance. So, uh, well, anyways, I would like to kind of do a and a I just want to give a little overview and just uh, uh, but if anybody would like to speak about something, ask about something, um, I'd really enjoy to. Yes? The question was that in other works that I made, or I used the word proletariat before, and that whether my current art addresses economic issues. And you know, I think that uh, you know, my own work, when it was starting to address economic issues, uh, it wasn't even really so aware of an economic discourse other than you know, trying to tell people to maintain their, their power. So I, I believe that I've always, in a way, have been kind of for the underdog in that art can be something that can really be used against people, and it doesn't give them a chance for uh, self-empowerment, and it actually just makes the person who's using it against them feel a sense of empowerment. Or you know, it can be used to uh, help empower. And I believe that I've always been trying to empower. Uh, the new work, I believe, has a discourse that is just dealing with trying to uh, 
let people kind of feel a sense of, of humanness in a way, of being uh, human and of um, this sense of, of connection, this biological uh, aspect of, about being the true narrative that they can uh, kind, kind of in a way find a reassurance in that. I think it deals with an aspect of uh, mortality and a, a kind of a realism of really what it does mean to be human. Um, there, there are a billion narratives. And you know, the way the universe works, it's just absolute chaos that uh, for another configuration to be possible. So anything can be destroyed and torn down. So if you find anything that you can kind of put some hope into it, you should go with it. Yes? Uh, you talk a lot about self-acceptance and empowerment and that kind of thing. And I wonder how you feel or reconcile the fact that you think you're or, uh, alienate a lot of people or is that sort of the, the story around you across the times that the contemporary art uh, sort of alienates the, the average viewer? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I think that uh, the works can only speak for themselves, and you, you know, if you can interact with the works, what you get away from them. I try to make works that are about the viewer, and that you know, the only place the art happens is within the viewer. And uh, uh, if that happens, that's wonderful. I would like to try to make things that uh, perform that way, even to a, you know, a, a higher level. That's always uh, kind of my goal. I think there's a lot of misinformation when you look at uh, media. They generate, they turn things on their own. And what happens, it just, uh, you have people that just jump on bandwagons. And it's that way in almost every profession and in life and areas of leadership and everything. But before you know it, these things just start going. And so perceptions happen. Some of it's true, some of it's not true. Uh, I, my work, uh, has gone for vast sums of money. And uh, is it about money? No. Is there a dialogue? Have I used aspects? Uh, yes, but I never made works that were about money. If they have attracted money around them, hopefully it's been for uh, a certain type of power that's in, been embedded in them. Now that doesn't mean that I did a great job or anything and I'd like to make things stronger, but I believe that students, people, that if you want to have kind of freedom and that economic freedom does help you have artistic freedom, you get it through just doing great work and you get it through really um, uh, just taking that work as far as you can, not getting involved in the economic aspect, that automatically will follow you, you know. Uh, um, so I don't know if that answered uh, your question, but uh, does the new work have an economic thing? Uh, they're made on a certain scale. The works tend to, over the years, have gotten kind of institutional because of how many works that I can make a year and uh, where they're shown. I am trying to get my works also to be also smaller in scale. I've been conceptualizing on that, and it's taking a little time that it just feels intuitively correct. But there are a couple new pieces that tend to be much more intimate. Uh, less institutional. Uh, yes. Uh, the question was uh, that I work with a lot of inflatables, and because I put my own breath into them, does that make them any different? But you know, I'm not really conscious ever whether it be my breath or not, because the insides for me become very kind of uh, vacuous in a way, and it's more about that. There's this anthropomorphic aspect and this sense of inflation and that art does let you kind of expand your parameters and this inside outside it's very funny but the um, inflatables you know when you look at them uh, a lot of times you you know you look at them and you think of the inside kind of um, uh, being um, I want to be sure that I'm saying this correctly but because uh, in our life right now we think of the outside world as kind of being very kind of uh, uh, empty, right? But then when you look at an inflatable, there's a sense that uh, 
things kind of get reversed there. There's this uh, exchange that takes place where there's all of a sudden uh, a density that comes outside and they become very empty inside. And I think that kind of makes people feel a certain sense of uh, security. But I may have just gotten that reversed. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Abby was saying about being my day, but now this is really a thrill to celebrate uh, um, Abby and all that he's done for, uh, for Micah, so it's great. Yeah.